constant capital, the means of production, considered from the standpoint of the creation of surplus value, only exists to absorb labour, and with every drop of labour, a proportional quantity of surplus labour. While they fail to do this, their mere existence causes a relative loss to the capitalist, for they represent, during the time they lie fallow, a useless advance of capital. The prolongation of the working day beyond the limits of the natural day into the night only acts as a palliative. It quenches only in slight degree the vampire thirst for the living blood of labour. To appropriate labour during all 24 hours of the day is, therefore, the inherent tendency of capitalist production. For the capitalist, the constant capital, that is, the means of production that they've advanced, can only transfer their value when it's worked upon by the labourer. Cotton cannot turn itself into a hat alone. An expensive machine that helps labourers make thousands of hats a day still cannot function without the labourer. When they're not in use, their value lies asleep, and it's a loss for the capitalist chase for profits. For the capitalists, not only is there more surplus labour, more profit, in keeping the work going for 24 hours a day, but it also lowers the costs of production. Factories need to be heated. Many machines of the time required a large amount of coal or fuel to get them started, less than that required for them to run once hot. Forges and furnaces all required heating, which took fuel and time. For the capitalists, these are also a loss of profits. Being as it's impossible for a labourer to continually work for 24 hours without rest, night work and the relay system became the standard. The relay system was a method of employing labourers to work hours during the night for a week, then swap to day shifts for a week, while another group of labourers do the opposite. In this short section, Marx again examines the factory reports to highlight the conditions faced by those working night shifts, the majority of which were children. It is impossible, the report continues, for any mind to realise the amount of work described in the following passages as being performed by boys of from 9 to 12 years of age. Marx mentions that the age of the children in these reports are from 18 to as young as 6 years old. The report details that they worked for 12-hour shifts for up to 5 days a week, which often went on for longer, in some cases for 18 hours a day. Instead of returning home, they would simply sleep on the factory floor under their coat. They would be paid around four shillings a week, which in today's terms, adjusting for inflation, is equal to around 13 pounds. Throughout the reports, there are many quotes from the capitalists themselves, stating that they would be against the raising of the age limits for child labor, as it would simply hurt their profits too much. This slow sacrifice of humanity which takes place in order that veils and collars may be fabricated for the benefit of capitalists. What is a working day? What is the length of time during which capital may consume the labour power whose daily value it buys? How far may the working day be extended beyond the working time necessary for the reproduction of labour power itself? It has been seen that to these questions, Capital replies, the working day contains the full 24 hours, with the deduction of a few hours of repose without which labour power absolutely refuses its services again. Hence, it is self-evident that the labourer is nothing else, his whole life through, than labour power, that therefore all his disposable time is by nature and law labour time, to be devoted to the self-expansion of capital. Marx first discusses that as we have previously seen, capital and its 24 hour a day thirst for surplus value views the life of the labourer as nothing more than a commodity, that the worker's life is little more than profit and it will use up their lives without care in order to obtain those profits. It has no care about the labourer's need for education, intellectual development, social functions or for the free play of their bodily and mental activity. Capitalism lengthens the labourer's time of production by shortening their actual lifetimes. But because labour produces the commodities for its own reproduction, the necessities for its and its children's survival, then the less time it labours, the less time it has for its own reproduction. 
much like it is cheaper and more efficient to throw away a tool and buy a new one instead of repairing it every day. Capitalists act in a similar way. Capital is forced to use up the laborers' lives faster and faster over generations, as the lifespan of workers and the time that they are physically healthy enough to actually work get shorter and shorter. So, capital must respond to this problem by replacing laborers at a faster and faster rate. Marx here returns to American slavery and discusses how, in all of its brutality and complete lack of care about the lives of the laborers, it killed entire populations of people in some places. But it mattered very little to capital, as more slaves would continually be imported in from around the world. Marx also discusses how the same thing was observable throughout England in all branches of industry, even in the countryside. Labourers were not just imported in from different counties within England, but from all over Europe. So capitalism views populations as merely external commodities, a reserve supply of future labour for its own growth. But looking at things as a whole, all this does not indeed depend on the good or ill will of the individual capitalist. Free competition brings out the inherent laws of capitalist production in the shape of external coercive laws having power over every individual capitalist. While you may have noticed, Marx has been somewhat generalising capitalists and their evil and greedy obsession with profits. But this small sentence in this chapter hints towards a discussion that will come later, and it's what it is that specifically forces the individual capitalist to act this way. But that, as often is the case with Marx throughout the book, is something we'll return to another time. The establishment of a normal working day is the result of centuries of struggle between capitalist and labourer. The history of this struggle shows two opposed tendencies. Marx now returns to an historic look at the struggle over the working day from the 14th to the 18th century. The notable sections I'll briefly mention here are the Ordinance of Labourers of 1349 under King Edward III. At a time when labourers were moving somewhat freely around England and demanding their own prices for their work, the wealthy elite began to suffer under this economic shift. The Ordinance, considered the first English labour law, set the prices on the maximum wage people could receive, forced everyone under the age of 60 into work and imprisoned anyone that was caught giving money to those not in work. The Statute of 1496 under Henry VII forced the length of the working day for agricultural labour to be extended to around 15 hours a day, while the Statute of Queen Elizabeth I in 1562 aimed at reducing the amount of time labourers were allowed to take for lunch and rest. It takes centuries before the free labourer, thanks to the development of capitalist production, agrees, i.e. is compelled by social conditions, to sell the whole of his active life, his very capacity for work, for the price of the necessaries of life, his birthright for a mess of pottage. We can see two important points from these examples. Firstly, that the struggle over the length of the working day has been ongoing for many hundreds of years, as labourers fought back to resist the imposition of work ruling their lives. And secondly, that capitalism, in its early formation, had to gain the power of the state and its laws to enforce this domination. Marx points out that, even still throughout the 18th century, before the rise of industrialization and large-scale industry, capital in England had not completely succeeded in gaining control of the workers' whole week. Most workers, who could live for a week on the wage of four days of labour alone, saw little reason for working for a capitalist for another two days a week. But in its blind, unrestrainable passion, its werewolf hunger for surplus labour, capital oversteps not only the moral, but even the merely physical maximum bounds of the working day. It usurps the time for growth, development and healthy maintenance of the body. It steals the time required for the consumption of fresh air and sunlight. It higgles over mealtime, incorporating it where possible within the process of production itself, so that food is given to the labourer as to a mere means of production, as coal is supplied to the boiler, grease and oil to the machinery. It reduces the sound sleep needed for the restoration, reparation, refreshment of bodily powers 
after just so many hours of torpor as the revival of an organism, absolutely exhausted, renders essential. It is not the normal maintenance of the labour power which is to determine the limits of the working day. It is the greatest possible daily expenditure of labour power, no matter how diseased, compulsory and painful it may be, which is to determine the limits of the labourer's period of repose. Capital cares nothing for the length of life of labour power. All that concerns it is simply and solely the maximum of labour power that can be rendered fluent in a working day.